All right. Good morning. It is day 24 and we will be talking about minerals and liquid hot magma today. Okay, so just before we get too far into this, go over some logistics. All right. Um, I talked about a lot of this in the previous slide, which you can go back and watch, but I, I do have a couple of things I need to clear up. So last week before Spring Breaker, you know, before all hell broke loose, I assigned Chapter 3 in Interlude C, not A. That was a mistake in one of my emails that were originally due today at 5. And I just remind people this is totally optional. You'll get credit if you do it, but no penalty if you don't, okay? This Sunday, there will be lecture quizzes from Wednesday of this week and today's lecture. They're really short. They're on Blackboard. Access it through Blackboard, all right? And then next week, right, I'll release Lab 7, which is about volcanoes, and it's just flying around on Google Earth and describing different characteristics of volcanoes. I'll release that on Monday morning, and then you will have until um, Sunday, March 29th at midnight to turn it in. And then next week for reading, You'll need to read chapters four and five. I originally only said uh, five, but four is also important to read. So um, those will both be due um, next Sunday, March 29th at 11.59. Um, and I'll get the PDFs up on Blackboard for you, okay? And then all of next week, we will be talking about magma and volcanoes and igneous rocks. If you want, you can come to my digital office hours today at noon. I'll host a you know, webcam meeting so you can just chime in, test out Teams, uh, or you can just type out a message on the team uh, sort of bulletin board or whatever. And uh, yeah, I saw a few people on Wednesday who tried it out and I think it worked out pretty well. So give it a shot if you like it. So anyway, let's... Uh, jump back in to lecture now. So before we, uh, you know, went to this remote setting, we were talking about minerals and sort of the building blocks of all rocks and the crust and everything that we see and experience as humans here. And so the thing that we need to remember is that Minerals are the building blocks of all crystalline rocks. Crystalline rocks being the ones that are made out of uh, crystal, crystals which have grown in place beneath Earth's surface, not rocks like sedimentary rocks, which are um, fragments of other larger rocks. So a couple things, right, is that all crystalline rocks are made of minerals, but minerals are not made of crystalline rocks, right? And we can remember the main characteristics or requirements of minerals is that they have a specific chemical formula. They are naturally occurring. They are solid, right? They're not a liquid or a gas. They're abiologic, meaning they only form through inorganic processes, and they have a specific crystalline structure, right? So in the case of quartz, which has the chemical formula of SiO2, it forms naturally. It is a solid. It's only formed through geologic processes, not by, um, not by anything biologic. And the actual crystal lattice structure of SiO2 is a tetrahedron, okay? So what are the properties of mineral crystals, okay? So crystals are single continuous pieces of a crystalline solid. That makes it a mineral. That single continuous piece of a crystal is bounded by flat crystal faces. So let's get on my laser pointer. So a crystal face is this surface that you could place your hand on. So if you went into one of these crystal healing shops, it's on these giant rose quartz crystals, you could place your hand on the surface of that quartz crystal. 
the chemical structure, right, SiO2, is expressed as a crystal shape. And that is because of the symmetrical patterning of the crystal lattices, the atomic ordering within the crystal. And what you see as a cool looking crystal at a rock shop or something is the macro expression of the microscopic crystalline structure. So minerals have many different colors, right? And many different um, characteristics, right? So quartz, you've seen other colors of it, right? You may see clear quartz, like we saw on the previous slide, or smoky quartz, like this picture, which is rose quartz. And those variations are due to impurities within the crystalline structure where uh, uh, sort of like replacement in the crystalline lattice by other elements causes changes in the color, okay? So rose quartz, which does not have any healing properties, it is really just silica oxide with um, pink borosilicate minerals that are placed inside of that SAO2 structure, giving it a pink color, okay? All right, so if you want to know more about minerals and mineral symmetry, I advise you to go back to um, day 23's lecture, which was the day before spring break. And uh, I talked about, well, you'll see in the slides, I haven't recorded that one uh, because that was before uh, remote instruction, but you can go back and look at that. But we haven't really talked about why minerals form that. So minerals can form through five different processes. The first of which is solidification or freezing of the melt or liquid, right? That's one that should be relatively easy for you to imagine because we can see that phase change happen in daily life, right? Liquid water freezes into ice, okay? The same thing happens when you have molten magma beneath their surface that cools and solidifies into a solid rock. During that cooling and solidification process, crystals form. The other type of mineralization um, process is precipitation from a solution. Okay, so this can occur with salt, where if you have um, input of a lot of uh, uh, salts into water that are in solution, and then you dry out the lake, right, all the salts that are in that lake or that ocean, and evaporate away all the water, the H2O is going to go into the atmosphere, but whatever was in solution is now going to solidify into a crystal. And that's all salt is, okay? It's the stuff that's left behind when water evaporates. Another type is solid state diffusion. And this is when you have movement of atoms within a pre-existing solid. And when you change around that atomic ordering, you are changing the mineral structure and therefore changing the mineral, okay? This happens in metamorphic rocks like gneiss. Another type of mineralization is biomineralization. And this is when minerals grow at a biophysical interface. So I know that I said in the previous slide that minerals are always abiologic, right? What that means is that we, you can have processes that are biologic that sort of catalyze or encourage minerals to form, but like animals aren't making minerals um, to survive, right? Like we don't make minerals in our body to survive, but there can be byproducts or reactions from animals or organisms that result in the formation of minerals. So one example of this is the pearls that will form in clams, okay? That's, the pearl is actually the waste product of the filtering of seawater for nutrients that clams are performing. Another type of mineralization is precipitation directly from a gas. Okay, so this is a, uh, another phase change, a more extreme phase change where you have a gas, where you have all those free floating molecules that when atmospheric conditions change, they immediately precipitate into a solid. And this happens in volcanic areas when you have uh, the release of sulfur gases here in volcanic vents, you can actually form solid sulfur as a result. 
Okay, so in the next slide, I'll just show sort of this in pictorial way, all right? So each of these pictures summarizes what I just showed, but I'll repeat it again, okay? So I'll start over here with precipitation. So the precipitation of minerals, right, you have this dried out lake, and you end up accumulating the salt crystals through evaporation, right? Diffusion, solid state diffusion can happen as um, atoms migrate through that crystalline solid, you actually change the crystalline shape and uh, therefore mineralogy of that rock. Biomineralization, okay, so we can have like with a, a uh, calcium carbonate shell, right, low shell remaining calcium carbonate, and over time the production of that calcium carbonate um, can actually sort of degrade into a microcrystalline structure, okay? And then finally, here's another one of precipitation of a mineral directly from a volcanic gas, right? Here's a, a sulfur-rich cloud from a volcanic vent that right here along the edges on solid rock, it precipitates directly into this yellow pure sulfur. And then I waited to talk about solidification from melt because this is the one that's most logical and the one that's most important for understanding um, igneous rocks and volcanology, okay? So here we have a, a totally molten piece of Earth's interior, right? And as it starts to cool, minerals start to form, right? Cooling towards a freezing point, all right? So over time, this entire molten liquid will freeze into a crystalline solid with interlocking crystals, okay? All right, so let's go to somewhere where we can see this process of molten liquid rock, okay? So let's start, let's take a digital vacation to Hawaii, all right? And we'll, you know, still in Vermont yes. here. All right, enhance, enhance, enhance. Okay, so we'll go to Kilauea. So Kilauea is a uh, part of the Hawaiian island chain. It is a hot spot volcano, which we haven't really talked about in this class yet um, because it's sort of an oddball um, tectonic setting. But this is a place where we have an immense amount of heat coming up from the mantle right to the ocean floor and creating the Hawaiian islands, which are a series of volcanoes. And Kilauea is the sort of leading edge of the Hawaiian hotspot volcano chain. And two years ago, in sort of the extreme eastern part of the big island of Hawaii, there was a really spectacular um, eruption of a fissure, which is sort of like a, an, a vent um, that's associated with the main volcano of Kilauea that erupted and produced a ton of lava. So I wanted to show this video from the USGS because I think it does a really nice job showing what this looks like. Helicopter sound, but all right, so what we're seeing in here is the eruption of molten material from Earth's interior coming up to the Earth's surface as lava fountains, right? So it's kind of hard to tell from this video, but you know, these lava fountains can be hundreds of feet tall and it's completely molten rock, it's dense, right? But it is so hot and under so little pressure that it's flowing like a liquid. Okay, and you can see these hot orange bands. That's where you have active flowing lava across the landscape. So this was sort of a surprise for this part of Hawaii and there was actually a large suburb that had been built in this part of, uh, of the Big Island, you know, in the last 30, 40 years. And they didn't know that this volcanic fissure would erupt 
and it completely destroyed um, a large portion of that community. This part of the video is good because it shows that erupting lava fountain, and then on the edges down here, near the you know green vegetation, we see where that hot molten magma lava has now cooled and solidified into dark black rock, fresh new rock. Okay, so this is where we're seeing the creation of new rocks at Earth's surface. Pretty jittery camera. Okay. All right. So how do we talk about igneous rocks and uh, minerals that solidify from melts? Okay. So when we talk about the molten material that forms new igneous rocks, we can specify whether it's above ground or below ground. If it's below Earth's surface, we call it magma. Okay? If it's above Earth's surface, what erupts out of a volcano is called lava. Right? So volcanoes erupt lava to vents, calderas, lava flows that stream down the sides of them. When that lava cools or when the magma cools, it solidifies into a igneous rock. So igneous rocks form from that cooled melt. And we have two different types of igneous rocks based on their origin. So if we have igneous rocks that formed from lava, they formed as extrusive or volcanic rocks, formed above or at Earth's surface through rapid cooling of lava. So a way to remember this is that if you think back to like Greek, and well, this is Roman mythology, is that the Roman god of fire was named Vulcan, okay? Volcanoes, Vulcan. Volcanoes erupt fire. The other important part about volcanic or extrusive rocks is that the crystals are really small because you go from really, really hot temperatures in the volcano to suddenly relatively very cold temperatures in the atmosphere or in the ocean. And so crystals form very quickly because they have to they go from a hot temperature to a low temperature fast. The other type of igneous rock is an intrusive or plutonic rock, and that forms through the solidification of magma beneath their surface. So the way to remember this is that Pluto was the Roman god of the underworld. All right, so Pluto underground, right? Magma cools underground plutonic rock. This is an intrusive rock because it intrudes into the surrounding rocks below Earth's surface. Okay? When we look at intrusive rocks or plutonic rocks, the crystal size is often a lot bigger because it cools more slowly. And what I mean by that is that you start with a really hot temperature and that temperature decreases as it cools much slower. So those crystals can nucleate and grow to be much wider and bigger crystals, okay? Versus those that erupt out of a volcano and they just instantly quench. So what causes liquid hot magma? So liquid hot magma really only forms in about the upper 50 to 250 kilometers of our mantle, okay? And there's three main processes that cause melting. The first is melting to decompression, okay? When you have a ton of pressure on top of rocks deep in the mantle, molecules in the rocks can't move. The, you know, the fundamental quality of whether something's a solid, a liquid, or gas is the ability of molecules to move around in space. But if you're under immense amounts of pressure, under all that rock that's above you, you can't move around, so you can't, can't go from being a solid to a liquid. Okay, so when you reduce the pressure, you actually allow rocks to remain very hot, but now they can melt because there's no pressure on them. The next type of melting is due to the addition of volatiles. And a volatile is water or gases, things that don't like to stay in a solid, confined space, right? Gases want to move wherever they can. They go to the, the easiest place to flow. Same with water. 
And so when you have a lot of these volatiles in the mantle or um, deep in the crust, they cause chemical reactions with other rocks around them. And this causes melting because it breaks things down. So when you add volatiles, you actually decrease the melting temperature, the melting point of the surrounding rocks. And then another way to melt a rock is that if you have a lot of rising heat from the mantle at one location, you can melt surrounding rock around it. Okay. So let's talk about decompression melting with a little more depth. Okay. So when we talked about permafrost, we actually sort of began this journey. And we're talking about the geotherm, the geothermal gradient, which is the change in temperature with depth. Right. So this black line here is the geotherm of the geothermal gradient. X-axis is temperature, y-axis is depth. As you go down towards the core of the earth, the temperature increases along this line. Okay, but the other part of this graph is that as you increase depth in the crust, you are also increasing the pressure at each point. So think of it like this, right, is when you go to the swimming pool, um, you get in the shallow end and stick your head underneath the water, you don't feel a lot of pressure on your eardrums, right? But then if you go down to the deep end of the pool and you go under 12 feet of water, right, now you suddenly can really feel all that pressure. What you're feeling is the weight of all of that water on top of you. So now think about the earth is that if you are you know, relatively shallow near Earth's surface, there's not a lot of rock weighing down on top of you. So the pressure is relatively low. But as you go down towards Earth, Earth's interior, you have more and more rocks stacked on top of you, and that exerts pressure. Okay? So how does this relate to decompression melting? Okay? So we have two curves that are important here, right? We have a solidus curve, the green, and the liquidus curve, the red. Whenever you are at a point below or to the left of the solidus curve, rock remains solid. The pressure is too high and the temperature is too low for rock to melt. To the right of the solidus curve and the liquidus curve, you have temperatures and pressures which are which are sufficient to allow melting, right? So we can think about it this way. If you have some rock at point A on here, right? And it begins to move through the crust here beyond the solid point because it's slightly liquid, right? And it moves up towards the surface, the temperature isn't changing but the pressure is decreasing, and so you begin to melt, right? So that is what decompression melting is, is that you're no longer put under all that pressure as a solid rock, but you're hot enough that you can turn into a liquid, and so then you have free movement of molecules as a liquid, okay? So where are some places that this can happen? Okay, so one place is a mantle plume. This is where you have a zone of really, really high heat movement from the lower mantle up towards the surface, right? And as that mantle material moves with that rising heat, it reduces in pressure or it experiences less pressure and begins to melt. So what you get is a lot of melting and production of magma and above these magma mantle plumes that erupts hotspot volcanoes like Hawaii, as well as Yellowstone. Another area where we have decompression melting is in continental rifts, where as the plates are stretched, the lithosphere is stretched and pulled apart, it becomes thinner and thinner. Because it's thinner and thinner, there's less weight overlying that part of the athenosphere, and the asthenosphere can rise up. That's a reduction in pressure, so that allows pressure melting. If we go out into the middle of the ocean, to a mid-ocean ridge, you have really quite thin 
ocean lithosphere that's still pretty hot, right? And so you actually have very low pressure. So this allows this sort of continual uprising of hot magma that is molten beneath the mid-ocean ridges, okay? That's all decompression melting. Melting from volatiles is, uh, is slightly different, and it is more common when we look at the other end of the tectonic conveyor belt at a subduction zone. So this subducting plate is going beneath Earth's surface with all of the sediments and rocks that have formed in the subduction that accumulated when it was as ocean sediment and then deformed into uh, new rocks at the subduction zone. And as it goes deeper in the mantle, those volatiles are released and it causes chemical reactions with the surrounding athenosphere, which leads to melting. And then that melt rises up and we actually get volcanoes. So the volcanoes like in Washington state in Oregon are formed through this process. And then the other type melting from heat transfer is where we have rising hot magma that causes melting around surrounding crustal material, okay? So this is basically just like, um, you know, kind of like burning your mouth in a way, right? It's, you're causing uh, melting or chemical reaction just by interacting with something hot, even though what was there was initially cool, okay? And so in this setting, right, we have hotter magma that's melting the crust around it, and that allows for um, that magma, the new magma, to rise up and erupt as a volcano, okay? Now, what are melts made out of? Melts all contain silica, okay? And then they contain lesser amounts of aluminum, iron, calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, and then all other elements. This is reflected in the composition of Earth's crust, okay? So if we look at this pie chart or this table and look at the percent by weight of each of these elements, we see that oxygen dominates followed by silicon. Silica is silicon oxide, okay? So SiO2, that is most of the material that's in the crust. So all of our melts are going to have SiO2 in it, and then they will have different amounts of these uh, common but less com but less so uh, elements. In addition, we also have volatiles in some melts. Volatiles would include things like water, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, uh, hydrogen gas, H2, and uh, sulfur dioxide, okay? We classify melts as whether they're wet or dry in terms of volatiles. A wet melt has up to 15% volatile content, and then a dry melt doesn't have any volatiles in it, okay? So because all rocks have, or all melts have silica in them, they're really, it's really important to understand how the amount of silica in that melt is going to determine the different types of igneous rocks that will form. And when we talk about um, melts and igneous rocks, we classify them on the spectrum of whether they're felsic or they're mafic. So a felsic rock is one that has a lot of silica in it. The way that I like to remember this is that if we break down the word felsic, we have fel, and a lot of feldspar, and sick, silica. Right? Felsic rocks, a lot of silica, and feldspar. They have up to 66 to 76% um, silica in them. As you decrease the amount of silica in a melt or igneous rock to the lowest amount, 38, 45 to 52%, we call it a mafic rock. So the way that you can remember mafic is that MA as in magnesium, and then thick, which is the iron, is the Latin uh, word for iron. So magnesium and iron in mafic rocks, less silica, okay? So if you look at this table here, the felsic rocks, right? The most amount of silica. If you have a little bit less silica, 
but not quite as much magnesium and iron. We call it an intermediate rock, followed by a mafic rock, which is 45 to 52% silica, and then ultramafic rocks, which have uh, the least amount of silica. So this is the, I think, one of the cooler things about um, igneous rocks and melting is that we can see these differences based on chemistry and interact with them with, you know, when you pick up a rock, okay? So a felsic rock is one that has mostly quartz and feldspar in it, and it's usually a lighter color, and they always contain abundant quartz. Because they contain abundant quartz, the density of these rocks is typically rather low. Right, so if we look at um, felsic rocks that are erupted at the surface, a rhyolite, or intrude beneath the surface, a granite, it's a lighter color and there's a lot of quartz in it, as well as feldspar. Intermediate rocks, where we have a mixture of felsic and mafic minerals, right? A little bit less silica, we end up uh, with rocks like andesite that erupt from volcanoes. You can remember it's a volcanic rock because the Andes have a lot of volcanoes, the Andes Mountains. And then I like to remember diorite as being a mixture of light colored felsic minerals and dark colored mafic minerals because this looks like salt and pepper. And then mafic rocks are typically very dark in color, right? Like basalt, which is the volcanic uh, volcanically erupted and formed. And then if it's below the surface, we end up with gabbro. And we learned about this when we talked about the origin of the ocean crust. And because mafic rocks have a greater abundance of iron and magnesium, which have uh, pretty high atomic masses, right? You can look it up on a periodic table. They have a higher density. And so mafic rocks right, have a much higher density than felsic rocks. So you can go out and pick up these rocks, look at the different minerals that are in them, as well as measure their differences in density and the grain size of them, and you can determine whether or not they were erupted uh, extrusively or formed intrusively, and if they're mafic, intermediate, or felsic. Okay. So this can be a little confusing, right? Because I'm talking about all these uh, just elements and they're cooling beneath your surface. So one way we can think about this is with food, all right? So Iron Chef Geology, magma chemistry affects the physical properties of lava, okay, or, or melts. And what I'll end the lecture with today and maybe inspire you to make, uh, make some cookies or something is that if you change the volume or amount of certain ingredients in your cookie dough, you're going to change the type of cookie you get at the end, right? So someone did this experiment where they just altered the amounts of different ingredients in the cookies, like by changing the flour or using something other than flour, like cake flour, or using butter, or using all brown sugar, right? Or cooking them at different temperatures, you end up with very different looking different tasting cookies. So if you think about rocks, igneous rocks, and how they form, if you change the conditions, right, change temperature and pressure, or you change the ingredients, the amount of silica, or the amount of magnesium and iron minerals, mafic minerals in that melt, you're going to end up with a different rock, a different cookie, okay? So Thanks for tuning in today. I'm going to try to keep these lectures shorter than the normal amount of time because I know it's hard to pay attention during online lectures, but thanks for tuning in and I will see you guys on Monday. Don't forget to do the quiz on Blackboard.